All right, the second step in uh, buy and hold is rehab. So let's talk about rehab right now. As uh, the first thing in overseeing a rehab, you need to estimate the cost before purchase. Do not go in blind. You can do, like that, that one page sheet I, I passed around, you want to have a piece of idea where you're at. Because, and, you want to, and you want to learn, you know, measure. When you have to do your final scope of work, compare that to your initial. Because uh, if you're wildly off and you just run through and add them up really quick, it's going to make your negotiations tough. You have to go back to the negotiation table. It happens. You don't be worried to do so, but you don't want to make a habit. You get your utilities turned on and then you prepare your scope of work. You can check the, the plumbing and, and the electrical and whatnot. Bid out the work if you're using contractors or subcontractors. And uh, I would get, unless you've got a contractor that you've used before and they do really well by you. I would say you get at least two bids, especially early on. You want to oversee product, you want to, uh, you want to pick the main contract and start, they pick the one out of the bids. Oversee the project and the vendors through the completion. Complete the punch out, and I will warn you, punch out always, always, always takes longer than you anticipate. It's amazing how many little knickknacks will jump out at you, and then it's like, oh yeah, I gotta do this, oh yeah, we gotta do this. It, just, in, just no. You got three weeks to finish the project. It's gonna be at least a week on the punch. Well, not. There's gonna be plenty of time to the punch up too. And then approve the payments. We'll talk about that more. But uh, let's go this real quick. This is a house that we purchased. Actually, we talked about it the other week. It's on uh, 79, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, in real estate and buy and hold, do sweat the small stuff. The small stuff is often very important, particularly with regards to the exterior um, and the front yard in particular. I know I say don't make the property glow. If there's one exception to that, it's the front yard. I don't know why I'm doing that, but here. So this is a, pro this is a four plus in bond in Raytown. We did spend quite a bit of money on this property. I don't know why it's doing that. Maybe it's for us. We did spend quite a bit of money on this property, but it was mostly on the interior. We did not spend much on the front. Uh, it was running for $500 a unit before. Now it's running for $650, and a lot of that had to do with just a couple of little things. We painted the trim. We did not paint the base. We painted the front door. We added these window boxes, and these in front put some flowers in them right there. And uh, little things, shutters, paint, new shutters and paint them, window boxes. You don't even need to put flowers in them. This is an exception. Bark mulch in the front. Put some bark mulch in front. It makes it look much more livable. Bushes and little plants and whatnot in the front yard are great too. Clean it up. There's nothing worse. I mean, we talked about anchoring before. If you have a bunch of trash in front of your property, anchor. They think this is a dump. Get the, clean up the property and try to keep it as clean, especially when you're showing for, to tenants or selling for that matter. So. Standardize, 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 standardize. I can't say this enough. You do not want to have 15 houses with 15 different paint colors, 15 different types of carpet, 15 different, it will drive you crazy. The main thing to standardize is your paint. Same paint color. Now I recommend two tone. Uh, doing a bit, uh, just one, one tone is quite a bit cheaper, but there's, for the money, I think it really brings the property to life to give it two tones. Paint a trim, a off-white color, and the base sort of a dark beige-ish, light, very light brownish color. Don't go too dark; it makes the room look smaller. Um, and I don't use flat paint. I hate flat paint. If you, you, you put a crown across it, you cannot get that off of the live view, and it's, it's just so drab. I wouldn't go semi-gloss; it's too shiny with like satin, satin, my uh, Use the same countertops generally with. Uh, rentals will be for mica. Same carpet and vinyl. I would not recommend builder's grade. It's the cheapest and, and we don't want to make these things glow really, but builder's grade carpet is so thin and just wears out so quickly, you're pretty much going to be replacing it every turnover. So go at least a step above that. Same appliances, maybe switch off between black and white for the same brand, uh, or size occasionally, try to keep the same brand. Same light fixtures, same ceiling fans. Everything you can do is the same. And if you do, if you are buying multiple classes of properties, um, instead of just going well, like all doing everything exactly the same, you know, you have really like an upper end house that you're running out, and you want the stainless steel appliances, go ahead. Then make two lists. Make your standardized items for 
this type of rental, like class C rental, like type of five is your class B rental. And just go from there. But standardize as much as possible, you will you will thank me in the future if you do that. Okay, so this is what our scope of work looks like. This it actually not, it's what my scope of work sheet that I put together in order to put together the scope of work sheet. Yeah, there'll be a test on this after this. So yeah. Anyways, hope if you can pass out a couple of those, I'd appreciate it. And again, well, if you email us, we can give you this stuff too, if you want. Yes. So here I've listed out various things, like I like the paint, the exterior paint. Is it good? If it's bad, what are the notes about it? Siding. Or maybe it's good, but there's one little tiny thing, so I note that in the column there. Siding, roof, all the way down, the lot, the, the, the garage. And then other here, because there's often things that just don't qualify in general categories. Um, this, I turn into this. And uh, I know this is written in Andrewese, and it's unreadable by any other person on the planet, but I can, and I, I then turn it into this. So Phil, now once you're done with that, if you can hand out our finished scope of work. This is finished scope of work that we have for uh, property that we're going to discuss some more in a bit. But it looks like, it basically looks like this. Now I'll note a couple of things about the scope of work. First of all, up here we have the, the contract lead. This is an employee of ours, actually, he's the lead on that project. Um, I, this one doesn't have, but generally I'll have a time. We have a time goal, so this project I think is three weeks, and it should be on that shit. I think I updated after I put it in here. Next thing, note: we have the contractor or employee total here. So that right there is the cost of, of only the contract. Like I talked in the previous uh, previous presentation, you know, the contractor might be twelve thousand. There's all those vendor items. There are all those vendor items that are going to add up. You have to be aware of. So the next we have our vendor list. So right here we have landscaping, and we're going to have a, a company come out and do the landscaping for us. the flooring, we're going to have a, a company come out and do the flooring, and on and on down the list. So then we come up with our, our vendor sum, and then I've got to add in, I've got to add the vendor sum and the contract total together, I've got to take a holding cost into consideration, and also got to have that 20% contingency, 20% of their about, we use 20%. So stuff, they're change orders, there's always going to be change orders, unless, and so just be aware of it and build it into your budget. Thank you, Susan Co. Then this project is $27,000. So we're going to put together a scope of work together. Um, this is the property that we purchased. It's on 1166 East 76 Terrace, right by, right close to our office. Beautiful uh, Tudor home. I call them gingerbread houses. Uh, but it's, it's, uh, it's a great house. It just needs a little bit of fixing up. So I'm going to go to slides and various pictures of it. Just shout out. Uh, shout out uh, anything you think that needs to be put on our scope of work. I will be handing out gold stars, so please. please. <laughs> okay, so here we go. Here's the first picture. It's the side of the house. What do we What do we got? What do we got? Siding. Siding right here. Do we need anything else other than just siding? Gutters. Yeah. Gutters. Oh, nice. Okay, we got the gutters. Any Anything else? Brick mold. What's that? Brick mold. Trim. The trim mold. Yes, actually, you need to get any trim. You need trim right here. And you're also going to need window trim. What about the gutters? Yeah, the gutters and the downspout. The downspout. Was there another one? The front door, does it close right? On all those the front door is not on this picture. Side. The front door is not on this picture, actually. This oh, is not. There's a window. Is that a window? Yeah. This is a, yeah, it's, it's a weird looking window. So it, it does not close right. It doesn't open either. Very <laughs> yeah. So let's, uh, yeah, so we got, we got to insulate, side, paint, and trim. Along this, this area right here. Where's your gutter space? Oh, we need to put it back on. <laughs> we need to fix the spaceship board. This one's right here. It, it's a tiny little thing, but it looks bad. And if a, tenant comes, a res, potential resident looks at it and might think, man, this, this landlord doesn't take care of their property very well. Bark mulch and landscaping. It's not a, you don't have to do it. But we do a little bark mulch right here and really bring the property to line. Gutter and a downspout. Definitely going to want that. And also, this, this brick facade here is kind of, it's kind of faded a little bit, it's a little dirty. Just power wash it. We don't need to do anything else to it, just power wash it, clean it up. Okay, so here's the side of the house. What do we need to do here? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you make these steps work really well? <laughs> handrail? Well, the handrail's here, but we could definitely use the spindles. Yeah. Yeah. Siding on the house. And, uh, Elevation, 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 elevation. If, if, if it was a finished unit in a bedroom, we would. But because this is just an empty, just a, a, a unfinished basement, just there's nothing down there. We don't have to have egress, unfortunately, out of it because um, 
but yeah, there actually there is a little. Uh, I'm talking about another slide. There is a, a little bit of a, a, a gap where you can see through, and, and, and air can get in there. So we do need to fill that. Gap. Uh, Deciding. Deciding. Deciding is not actually that bad. It doesn't need to be clean. It's probably worth power washing. Oh, we're talking about a piece of trim right here, right? Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, that piece of trim is rotted right there. Just a little spot. We do need to replace that. Make sure the water flowing away from the house. The way yeah. Of yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You always want to, this property. It actually might not appear that way, but it does flow away. But that's a very good point. You always want to make sure property is graded properly. It's, it's it's endlessly frustrating when I go to a house and it's in perfect condition. But they leave it where there's like this, just this hill going right here, their, their, their foundation wall, and then the foundation is this far in. And the, you know, the panel is like that on the wall. There's an electrical panel down in the basement. And that's, you know, that's thousands and thousands of dollars of work to do. And all they need to do is add some dirt. And so grading is extremely important. Don't, don't think like it. Okay, so yeah, this one will just run through real quick. You got them all in. First of all, you can't see this really, but there was an AC compressor unit that was supposed to be kind of right about in this area. Um, it, it, uh, it grew the legs and ran off. And what, what very nice. Uh, <laughs> compressor's cage. Compressor's yeah, cage. Yeah. Uh, yeah, not a bad idea to put a cage on it if it's in an area that has some, some crime issues to put a cage around it. We need some steps for the stairs. Those are not to code right now. Um, we need some spindles for the rail. This cable box is completely disappearing to get rid of it or, or get it back in order. And we need to replace that rock piece of trim and paint it to match. What do we got here? Uh, how about a you never really board board. Board. The is not leaning really. Okay. Well, we're looking at those. Okay. But this is a, a problematic um, doorway. It's a big step. It's a big step. Yeah. The, the foundation is not. It's not. It's, it's settled a little bit. It's settled. A, it's settled some, but it's not terrible. Uh, these older houses have generally settled some. It needs a deck. <laughs> it definitely needs a deck. They're uh, they're sort of sort of missing a deck. And so we probably want to put it about ten by six deck. Um, we got actually guys on staff, fortunately, who can do this very quickly and cheaply, very good at it. We also want to pair this trim board along the base here. Um, that, that extends a little bit further than where we want the deck to go. We need to add stairs to the deck, we need to add spindles, rail, and we want to stay in the deck too, protect it from the weather. In addition to that, this garage door is kind of hard to see, but it's a little bit discolored. The paint is peeling on this, this garage, or not garage, basement door here. So we want to, we probably want to paint that to match as close as we can. And, and you can't paint to match, it, it, you, you take like a chip of the paint, a little piece of it, take it to Home Depot or Sherwin-Williams, it can usually match it pretty well. It's not, not every time we've had our struggles with that, but generally it makes it match pretty well. Okay, what do we have here? This is the living room. This is actually a little deceptive. This floor is already sanded. There's no stain on it, except along these corners. Now, if, now when they sand, when they when they um, when they're sanding the floor, what they do is they stain, they, they sand it down, and, or it's just already bare. They'll put a layer of stain, and they'll put a layer of polyurethane on. So you need to, if you buff off the polyurethane, you can stain it again, but you're staining over stain that's already there. So sometimes you can get away with that; it's cheaper. But some, they've already sanded it off. All of it except this one little edge, but there's also no stain there. So we need to sand just the sides and then restain. Other than that, it's pretty good actually. There's not a lot to do here. Uh, so we want to sand the edges of the floors only. We want to stain the floors. And we, the walls are, are, the paint is pretty good. And we like the old wood trim, especially in a house like this. It kind of it fits the vibe of the house. Uh, but we do need to clean the walls off, and there might be a little bit of touch of paint. In addition to that, we often, we almost always, I think, now change out our outlets and outlet covers, it's, and, and switch covers too. Which is, they're not that expensive. Uh, it's like less than, it's like a dollar something for a cover, and, and uh, it's like a couple bucks for an outlet or whatnot. Um, and they really, they, the old ones look very dated and ugly often. They've often been painted or whatever. Um, so we like to change that. They, they make the house a much, much better vibe, and they're, they're not, they're not very expensive. What do you do when you have uh, non-grounded outlets? 
Non-grounded outlets, I mean, grounding is nice, but it's not, it's not in, uh, Don't put in grounded plugs. Well, that's a good yeah. 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 But you have to go back and... We do not, we, we do not run a ground wire, no. Um, it, it's, uh... Make sure you get the right out, kind of outlets. You just gotta get the right kind of outlets, yeah. Do you put GFIs in? Oh, uh, what can I talk about right now? Yeah, I mean, in a non-grounded... A GFI? Uh, I have to... A GFI doesn't work, it's not ground now. No, it doesn't work. Okay, and we actually we have not dealt with any non the vast majority of them. I, I, that's why I hesitate there. We were saying, like, when was the last time we had a non grounded house? I can't do Most of them we run across our ground. So here's, we're in the kitchen. Paint. What was that? Paint. Paint, yeah. yeah. And the paint is probably the right call. You know, this is a rental, we're not going perfect, so uh, it, these cabinets are perfectly functioning in order. They're just. Uh, it's not particularly attractive. New faucet, more yes, yeah. modern faucet. Yeah. That's that's an option, yes sir. Uh, this is a, a faucet function, of course, fine. But if you could you could add a faucet. That, that's that's I would say a uh, a maybe. It, it, it depends on what you're going for. But yeah. Um, so here here what we're doing. We're uh, painting kitchen cabinets. Plus let's add some poles. So we often paint them black in these cases, and they actually look pretty good. And um, and oftentimes we add, just adding a new pole of the handles to the cabinets really brings it to line. Um, in addition to that, I this is another maybe. I hate push and block. It's sort of just my my. I just don't like the look of it. It looks tacky to me. So I if it's not if it's uh, if this is a short run, cheap. But it's kind of tough. You can epoxy paint a lot of stuff. Uh, you can do it with bathtubs, backsplashes, and this. Probably do this, just make sure you have to clean it very, very thoroughly. Otherwise, it won't stick and it'll peel off. But I just popped to paint those back slash. Appliances, I know you can't see them, but I just have appliances. And this probably doesn't have a, a dishwasher, but it's got plenty of cabinets. There's more cabinets than just this. So we just take this cabinet out right here and add a dishwasher and, and plumb it for dishwasher spot. All your plumbing's right here, so it's very easy. So that's another thing to look for. Like this probably doesn't have a dishwasher. That's something a lot of residents will want. Healthy leasing. Uh, if it's pretty simple and you have plenty of cabinet space, they'll take out the cabinet, they'll take out the cabinet and, and fill it for dishwasher. Also, you can't see this, but the tile is in great shape, but the grout is like gone, so we need to recover the tile. What's your opinion about uh, garbage disposal? You know, I've heard of mixed reviews. I've heard people say that they're completely useless. I've heard people say they're worse than useless. I've also heard people say they're you're insane on tap. What's the question? Garbage disposals. Do you do you want or do you think garbage disposals are a good thing or bad? Or what was my opinion? Of them? So what's leave, your opinion? We usually leave them there if they're there. We won't install them if they're not. So there. we leave if they're there. We leave them if they're not there. We usually don't. And install we also them. say if there's a dishwasher, we usually think that should be a garbage disposal, but that's not 100. percent Yeah, so. that's 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 more in the maybe category, but. I don't have a great answer for you. I, I've heard so many different things, and I'm, I'm not actually positive. Through my personal experience, spend a few extra dollars, get a, if you're going to put one in, put in a good one. Okay. All right. That, that's maybe a good you point. put in a cheap one, you're going to buy it again. Okay. That, that's probably a good point there. And I, I'll, we'll have the questions at the end of that. I'll, I'll, I'll get to those in a second. And whether you have one or not, they're still going to put chicken bones down. And we're in the kitchen, so the ground is installed at the FCI outlet. You only need one, um, unless it's a huge kitchen, it's on more than one breaker. But each each um, each uh, outlet down the line is on that low. And so, that GFCI will cover it. And GFCI is a ground fault circuit interrupter, mm -hmm. and you want them near any source of water. So kitchens and bathrooms, you don't need them in bedrooms, so you want them there. That way if the water gets on or whatnot, it just shuts it off immediately. And uh, we want to, you know, we, it's first of all, it's code, and also we want to provide uh, safe and decent housing for our residents. So make sure to put those uh, GFCIs in there. Can you, can you, get, do you provide a fridge? Yes, we do provide all the washer dryer. We do not provide washer unless dryer. It's 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 unless it's a stack. Unless it's a stack. We don't even have a stack. Of water. And we try to avoid having to put stack holes because we don't want that <laughs> Okay, so we're in the upstairs bathroom. I'm going to run through these a little faster and just go through them. And I know you can barely see that. I forgot to put my flash on here. But a couple of things. One, we're going to regrout the tile. Just like, I don't know what the deal with the grout in this house was, but it's just not there. I don't have this vanity. It's really just a sink. And uh, usually you, you want the cabinets especially, and once, yeah, there's a medicine cabinet, people have more stuff than that usually to put in the bathroom. So we replace sinks and put vanities in. I don't even like pedestal sinks. 
We need a blind for the window. We need a GFCI outlet. Here's the bedroom. Not a lot here. It's in pretty good shape. Closet door. But yeah, we do need a closet door. And one thing I would, I would recommend not, not, not uh, forgetting about is door stops. If you don't have a door stop on, they're going to start to tear up your, uh, you know, they're just going to open the door and throw it into the wall, and you're going to start doing a lot of damage to your drywall. They're extremely cheap. Just something to, to remember to put on there. So, outlet and outlet covers again. And also, you get the door handle. This is a, a maybe, another maybe. You can leave them all on there. Door handle's not that expensive, too. If you do replace some, you should probably replace all, make it match. But uh, on this one, we will probably leave it. Furnace works fine. We tested it. A little old. But don't forget to put a furnace filter in there. You don't want to put a furnace filter in probably every six months. My maintenance guy can go out there and do that. Um, more the better, but uh, least, you know, six months is definitely what you should aim for. Your tenants will not be relying on to do it themselves. And definitely when you purchase properties, put in their first filter here. <laughs> this is a big mess. <laughs> but really, this one, um, we just need to run, run the ductwork to the vents. All the vents are there, but this, this ductwork got torn out. And running ductwork is not, it's not, it's an expense, but it's not, it's not crazy expensive. The plumbing is all fine, but we need to pin it up. It's a big spaghetti mess over here. So we need to make sense of it, pin it up to the ceiling first. That small gap exterior mission earlier is right behind there. Just fill it in and uh, clean out the garbage. Okay, so 76 budget. About a, we're going to be all into it for a, just shy of 60000 And it's, uh, it's about 20, the rehab is twenty four, and the purchase plus the closing was thirty five. dollars The market analysis on this one, this is a hard property to judge because uh, it's sort of in the middle of the area, and it's also potentially nice. It's a really nice looking home where the house next door has a little bit of a it's not, it's not as nice, but I came to about 8,000 probably, because it's about 20 in equity, which puts us at just about 75%. So we have, we can get that that long. This is not a great deal. It's a solid one, it works. Our rent price should be about 995, it's a three two house. It's very, very, it was a great curve appeal, uh, which puts us at a 1.66% rent to cost ratio, which is above 1.5%, so we're doing all right there. Assuming the, the uh, Assuming we have $3,500 a year in expenses and 10% vacancy with a 9% uh, or, no, sorry, cap rates of take more. Yeah. Uh, 10% vacancy, $3,500 a year expenses, we have a 12.1 cap, so we're doing pretty well. And the cash flow would be $1,856 a year, which is $150 a month, which with 9% interest only, we will refinance that out eventually and have an even better one. But we're doing just fine on this property. Uh, not a steal by any means, but it's a solid deal. And uh, this is just how we calculate it. And just, just, just to note, when you have a fully financed property that, uh, that cash flows, your return, your cash on cash return is actually infinite, which is a really nice thing. So I talked a little bit before about contract, uh, learning con construction costs. Um, one good way to contract your bids, make them itemized, go through them. Start to learn, compare and contrast. They will be different. Talking to other investors, talking to people in construction, books and online sources like the book I mentioned before, the from Bigger Pockets, and also reviewing your results. Make good sense to uh, get away to the end of the presentation. If you have to. Um, make make sure to uh, make sure to always review your results, even if it's painful. We've had projects that were been terrible. I mean, some of them come in under budget, but generally the error most people make is to come in over budget, not under budget. We've had a property, uh, it's just an absolute disaster. It was down in the Belvedere area of Grandview, and we bought it for 25, and I thought we were going to put, you know, if we put 25 minutes in the forks here, it was 50,000 should be worth playing more. But everything was wrong with that house. Um, like, the electrical in the basement didn't work. The, uh, the cabinets just turned to dust when you touched them. And all and on, and then we had a contractor we think we're, was, we had a lot of problems with. Ended up doubling the uh, the uh, rehab budget, and so it's it's one it's it's just highlight point due diligence is key. Had I spent more time on those cabinets, I probably would have realized they were bad. Uh, and I tested the electrical more carefully, I probably would have realized it was bad. And in addition to that, it's uh, it's you know it's it's just it highlights. Um, well, I, I talked about revealing your results, so that's painful. I didn't want to look at. It. I knew it was terrible. 
still want to look at it. Look at it very carefully. Learn from your mistakes. Do you have your contractors use the same bid sheet so you can compare? We do. I those? send them the scope of work. When I'm using a contract, we'll send them the scope of work, my scope of work, without the price, my, without my budgeted prices in there. And I tell them, you fill it out on my scope of work, or you don't get to work for us. I don't want to deal with it. I've seen, I've, I've tried to compare three contractor bids on massively different documents. Or, and also, some would include something, and some would include something that wouldn't tell me what they were included. Like, they're not taking something out, they wouldn't commission it. It's just a nightmare. So I just send them my document, and I say, put your bid on this document. I do that to stop. So there's some general costs. I don't even want to, want to spend much time on these, because they vary so much. It varies on things you have. Like, for example, an interior door. We usually get 125 is what a, what a contract would bid. An electrical panel is 1,000, but now we're going to have even less than that. Light fixture is 50, but if you get a nicer light fixture, it's much more than that. So it often, it's, it varies by the contract. We've had a contractor charge 125 for ceiling fans, we had another one charge 170. And it probably depended a lot on which ceiling fan they were putting in. So that one goes back to standardization. If you, and, and you can tell a contractor, I want you to use these materials. It goes back to that, and also goes back to the pair of your contractor. Sometimes we had one contractor bed that was so ridiculous. It, it wasn't like bad or good, but it was like both. So it was like a countertop for like, you know, just a countertop for bathroom vanity was like, was like $800. But then it was like floor, like all the flooring in the kitchen, like, like uh, $700. And it is a huge kitchen, by the way. And so it was like, it made no sense. So I just crossed off the ones that were all bad. I mean, I had a really good, had a really good fit for us. <laughs> Fortunately, that contractor did not try to do that particularly good, but it just shows you, I don't know, and if they, if you don't like what they have on something, Cross it off. Or tell them, like, I mean, it gives you all the leverage in the negotiation. You can say, these items don't make any sense. They're too high. You need to bring them down. What are they going to say? Oh, well, on these items, I was really low, so I'll do that. I'll bring them up. No, no not even Sean's that bold. So, <laughs> so you give, getting an itemized bid gives you the leverage in the negotiation. And it also allows you to get this money for these construction costs and compare and contrast. Because, you know, $150 for a toilet is a low end toilet. I just saw, I was Googling um, toilets the other day, and because that's what I do with my free time. <laughs> and, uh, and there was some toilet that was actually like a square, it was like a squarish toilet, and it was on sale from Home Depot. I was going on the website for $1,150, and I don't know why someone would uh, feel that, that a toilet would be worth that much. I, I want to give a crap about it. <laughs> it's like a hundred and fifty dollar pair of pants. Have you ever sat on a square? <laughs> I would just like to pause this. <laughs> so uh, the importance of measuring. Measuring is very important. Um, I, I talk about it. it can be painful sometimes, especially when when you have a deal that goes sideways. But you need to measure. If you're not, first and foremost, this else has helped you learn rehab costs. Okay, you, if you just, if you put together budgets and don't measure it, you're wasting your time. It is completely useless. You get nothing out of it. Because if your budgets are always coming in great, and you're like, oh, I'm doing fine, I'm doing incredible, but your real results are terrible, you're not going to learn that from, from comparing and contrasting, and you're not going to fix the problem. This is where you fix the problem. So it also brings a better ability to evaluate potential purchases. If you're buying these big rehabs and thinking you come in on a low budget, you're budgeting them all, and then all these things come up, and the property ends up not being very good, um, you need to know that. Maybe you're buying properties that need too much work, and you need to pay a little bit more, but buy properties in better condition. Uh, trust but verify. Measuring keeps honest people honest. And, uh, a watchful eye makes people, uh, you know, most people are good. Most people are decent. Not all, but most people. But even good people can sometimes be tempted by the dark side. Um, a watchful eye prevents that. And uh, you can also ask for the right amount of financing. We have, we want to finance properties before. You need to be very careful about this, especially if you're looking for private loans and you don't have a lot of startup capital. You need to be able to get the money you need to find. Now, you can ask for a second, or uh, in some cases, you can expand a loan, but, um, you want to ask the right amount of finance to fund, and knowing your rehab costs is key. The importance of accountability. Some contractors and some employees are simply utterly incompetent. In fact, some are in dishonest. In fact, we've been, 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 we've been,
are we picking up? I don't know. We've been we've been ripped off before, um, and you know we've had uh, we we're just dealing with uh, right now this subcontractor we stopped using sent us the most ridiculous bill we've ever seen, like fifteen to hundred dollars to hang some mini blinds, just move a little trash, and like paint some cabinets, which he did horrible. So it happens, um, and you have to, and and uh, the first thing is don't be afraid to lecture. I mean, if somebody's not doing right. Tell them they're not doing right. Don't be mean about it, but be fair and firm. This needs to, this needs to happen. If employees arriving late, you cannot arrive late and still work here. If a contractor is letting a drag, doing job to drag on, tell them that. People don't like, I mean, it's, it's, be nice, be, but, well, let's, let's put it differently. Be polite, but be firm. And furthermore, if you're going to hire employees, or even with contractors too, this, just get this in your mind. Hire slowly, fire quickly. I, we have never regretted firing people. It's, it's tough, it's, it's terrible to do, but it's, it's just... Can I add on to that? No. <laughs> <laughs> We've never regretted firing people. The only regret we always have is not letting them go earlier. That's yes. always been the problem. And that's virtually every case. There, on the number of cases where it's like, we did it at the right time, probably a single hand. And that's probably your, your, uh, your experience as well. Um, it's generally, the, the, the error, of, the normal error is to hold on too long. I don't like marriage. <laughs> 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 I'm, I'm commenting on that. <laughs> there are four ways to rehab a property. You can do it yourself. You can hire a general contractor. Or you can hire subcontractors, the individual subcontractors, the handyman and the vendors, and oversee it all yourself. You basically are the general contractor. Or you can hire employees. That's the way we generally do it, along with some subcontractors. Now, doing it yourself, there are, the first advantage is it's cheap. You're not paying any employees, but it takes time, and time is equal to money. And so you don't pay, you don't, don't, you don't, you don't work for free. So it's, it, you got to take that into mind. You have more control of the project, but at the same time, no one is knowledgeable and skillful about everything. And many people uh, are not knowledgeable or skillful about the uh, 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 rehab project at all. You can start right away, you don't have to wait for them to become available, but you must still need a subcontractor because you don't know everything. And I'd say if, you've got to, if you're going to do it yourself, you've got to be honest about what you can do and what you can't do. You can't say, like, I know, I, I, I just believe I can, you know, I can install uh, whatever. Um, you need to be very honest up front. Like, let's say, oh, I install a countertop by certain someone in this room. So, uh, anyways, that being said, I absolutely love doing it yourself. They are the gift that just keeps on giving. <laughs> so I, I've seen, I've seen about, um, I've seen over a thousand houses in Kansas City that we've gone through and made my office on many in the last three and a half years. And I started a little picture project. So this right here is a closet with a lot of shelves, um, a lot of them. This right here, foam should be illegal, like for anyone. <laughs> it, it expands when you put after it dries. People don't know that, so. It should, all over the place. This right here, I, I'm not sure this guy knows how roofs work. <laughs> <laughs> Just in case, you know, you're in the basement, you got a whole throne right there, you know, you want some boxes and don't want to go all the way upstairs, right? Or you want to play basketball in the kitchen? Because that's, that's, uh, why not? Uh, who might have judged? If anyone can explain how this dishwasher works, <laughs> I, would, I would certainly, I would certainly be interested in that. But these are all like those little planks that you have, like like uh, those crates are made out of. This guy had them everywhere throughout the house. He built the shed out of them. And yes, that's an outlet cover. That's an outlet, and that's another one in the soffit in front of the house. This house is the most strangely wired house I've ever seen. One light switch. Turn every light in the house. <laughs> <laughs> I just turned it off. Right? It was absolute madness, but it was also a, a split in the summit for thirty-five thousand. So we actually bought that house. <laughs> this is actually good work, but I, this picture does not do it justice. This deck is three times the size of the house. <laughs> it just keeps going and going and going. And, and this is not what? Lawn care must be nothing. Oh yeah. <laughs> and the house is just a piece of garbage, and this deck is just magnificent. <laughs> it's a work of art. Okay, this right here is a plumbing stack. Okay. This right here 
is a healing duct. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a doorway into a concrete wall. <laughs> but I digress. Okay. General contractors. The advantage to a general contractor is they're usually skilled. They usually very. They usually have a lot of. Uh, they have good subcontractors. They're good employees. They they know what they're doing. They're, they're, you, know, you don't get a good general contractor being uh, being bad at what you do. I shouldn't say that. You usually don't. They're expensive though. Um, they're quick. Usually they'll do a product much faster than handymen or even uh, even your employees sometimes. Sometimes. Um, but at the same time, they're actually really expensive. And then uh, low hassle, usually they, they take care of a lot of the scheduling issues, uh, but they're possibly booked and gotta wait for them to, to start. So the good ones usually get booked. Can, can it wait to the end of the presentation or is it? Thank you. What is the a ballpark on how much more it costs to have a contractor, a general contractor versus yourself? So kind of handyman, 20 to, uh, versus yourself, I'm not 100 percent sure on that, but if versus handyman, 20 to 30 percent maybe? 30 percent? They have probably like 20 percentage. I mean, it's ballpark and very really high end contractors, 100 <laughs> percent. Um, they're easy to let go. If you have, if you don't have, if you use them project didn't like them, just never call them. But uh, it's also noteworthy. The skill, quick and low hassle, does not apply to all of them. Subcontractors are handymen. Uh, they're less expensive than general contractors, but they're more expensive than employees. Uh, they're specialized sometimes. Sometimes you have like a really good painter, and you also got a guy who's good at basic carpentry. You can have like, you can even mix and match a bit, so you can, get, you can take advantage of their specialization. More hassle than scheduling because uh, general contractor does a lot of that for you, especially if they take on some of the subcontractors. But these guys are also easy to let go. Just don't use them for the next project. But again, they're also possible. For you. Employees, uh, they're the least expensive, but because no overhead, no profit. But they're they're bad expensive. We actually had uh, one employee that we hired just for one job actually just literally told us, I feel like I'm working myself out of a job. If somebody ever says that to you, you fire them immediately. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, they said that there's no reason to finish the project quickly. Hand in, if they get done with the project, they get paid to get on the next one. Employee can just smell the clock. So you've got to be on top of it. More control, but it's also more hassle and scheduling. And you have more flexibility, you can change the scope if you need to much more easily, but you have to have consistent work, generally speaking. I mean, maybe you hire them on for one project, but if you were going to hire an employee, you need to give some idea, at least some security, that there's going to be more than one job. I mean, sometimes less happens, but you got to have something. They also start immediately, or whatever you want, and they're harder to look at, they got to fire them. And something, and it's something, if you're going to hire employees, you've got to be willing to fire them. It's tough, but it's not the Bring the right contractor, ask around, ask for referrals. If they've done right by somebody in this room, they'll probably be right by you. If they've done wrong by somebody in this room, they'll probably be wrong. <coughs> Interview the contractor, ask for pictures of their previous work, ask for how long a job took, ask for what the cost, things like that. Don't just, just assume they're good or, or take somebody else's word, but interview them. In addition, ask for references and call them. One, one of our contractors we, we, uh, we used, I, I asked for some references, I called them, and later he they're all great, and he came in and asked me, like, you know, he's like, you're the first person like 10, 10 years to call any of my references. And it's just like, you got to be kidding me. So you call the references, and because they'll often, you might think they'll just, they're just going to be a, a rubber stamp. Uh, they'll often tell you stuff that you would be very shocked and, and, and really tell you that no, you shouldn't actually use them. Uh, you get what you pay for. The cheapest contract is not always the best. It usually probably is the best. Uh, often they might be paying under the table or just do sloppy work. Um, any contractor you hire needs to have liability insurance, um, and if they have any employees, employees, if they have any employees, they need workman's comp. They need workman's comp insurance because otherwise, they can the uh, the workman's comp or uh, OSHA or no, whatever. They they consider you as owing uh, as uh, as owing that. If you hire a contractor and they don't have workman's comp for their employees, you as the owner are billed for it. So because they consider you as basically having to hire them. How do you document that? Uh, you get, you ask for a, 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 um, certificate a certificate of insurance, and on that certificate of insurance, it's part that's for workman's comp, and it should be checked off. Consider time incentives. It Maybe if it's a four-week project, or you think it's about that, three weeks, give them a bit of a bonus to finish it. If they go five weeks, they owe you five, if you're only, you take off $500. Five, another week, another 500 bucks, something like that. Always sign a contract, or have an independent contractor contract signed up front. That way you have, you, if there's a dispute, you know what to do with it, like go to mediation, etc. 
and don't be afraid to let them go, even if it's in the middle of a project. They're doing terrible by you. Try to negotiate a settlement to get out of it and get on to somebody better. And never pay all of it up front. Under no circumstance do you want to pay all the money up front. And also, don't cut the last check until everything, everything is done. Um, I, even, uh, I heard of recently that some people are doing where they pay 80% at the end, and then they'll do their own systems check, or, and, and, and if there's any other items, they have to come and finish it to that other 20%. Um, because you can't get contracts back out there if they've already finished, if they've already paid them. I employ the first two exactly the same. Ask around look for referrals. There are people, you know, I'm looking to hire somebody. Oh, I know John here, or whatever. Uh, and you give them what you pay for. If you're trying to get a minimum wage person to do skilled carpentry, you know, good luck. Interview them first, even for construction. Uh, we were able to figure out people were in for you know, coming with with beer on their breath, to show up late. There's all sorts of ways to just, just figure out that you don't want to you don't want to hire the person. Ask for references and call them. Furthermore, give them a trial. Don't hire them immediately. Give them a trial and tell them explicitly it's a trial. Not only is it a trial like, oh, we're going to try you for a couple of weeks, but have a specific date, 60 days, 90 days. At this time, we are basically going to reevaluate, and we are either going to not hire you or basically rehire. You. And make that clear to yourself, because you don't want to get that, oh, it's convenient to have this employee on board, so I'll just, whatever. I mean, they're not that great, but whatever. No, you need to make it This is the date we're going to decide whether or not you're, you're, uh, you're, you have a place here. Because you don't want to accept mediocrity. Mediocrity is so easy to accept. The great companies do not. And so it's, it's key to force yourself to make decisions to let go of people who are not, who are not great. Demand accountability. Um, uh, like I was saying before, uh, they, uh, you don't want to let if they're showing up late to work. You need to tell them to fix it, and if they don't, you know, go. They get hire slow, fire fast. This is not really. Uh, this is a great book on hiring. It's called Who by GF Smart. It's not really applicable to construction employees, but if you're hiring office staff, it's a fantastic book, and I highly recommend. It. Okay, so scheduling employees and contractors. Time is money. The faster you can get started, the faster you can finish, the better. Think ahead. You want to be two or three weeks out at least, and so you know what's coming. What do I need to prepare for? You don't want to be reactive in this. You want to be proactive. You want to be careful and respectful of time. You don't want to bring the, the carpet guys out when there's, the subfloor needs to be fixed. Um, so really be cognizant to, to respect other people's time um, as well, and be careful about that when you're scheduling. It, it, mistakes happen. Don't don't get all up in arms about it. Just try to do what you can. Have, have backups. So if you if you have one plumber and that plumber's booked out all week, you know that, that's a good problem. Uh, you know you want multiple guys and people to be able to do these different things. So have another have two plumbers. You have a primary plumber, a backup plumber, at least. You know several handymen. You know, have a list of people. And where do you go if you uh, if the person you normally use is booked, or if all of a sudden things go sour? We've had guys have been great by it. and then all of a sudden just turn on a dime and started doing shy work, charging too much, etc. And it happens, have backups and prevent delays. And don't tolerate flights. They don't show up if, if, if they're coming in late handing or whatever, just move on to the next person because that they're really bad sign. I mean once it's, it happens, but if it's consistent, just move on. Next you need to create a system to monitor and schedule work. You cannot I highly I highly advise against having just a piece of paper and sticking us all over the place. Uh, you want a systematic approach, a schedule out of, of where people are going. This is what ours looks like. Uh, Phil, we can hand out a copy of that to everyone uh, and pass it around. But we have, I, I, this is an Excel doc, we actually have macros that you can hide this turnover part or hide this rehab part um, and expand it to show the list of vendors that are on the, each project. So we booked out, these are our employees, we booked them out here, this is a vendor, this is our painter here. This is sort of, we've changed our system, this is still, we're still working the kinks out. But you can see this is kind of an idea like, how do I schedule everything to make sure that people are all, that I, I've got each project assigned, each person assigned, and, uh, and I'm not wasting time, I'm not double booking, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm moving forward in this project as quickly as possible without making any mistakes. Project analysis. After the project's done, you don't want to just look at the number and say, okay, I budgeted 25 and came in at 25, great. I, I'm, I'm the perfect estimator of rehab expenses. Next, next, next problem. Just throw it out. Because maybe you were way high on HVAC and way low on floor or something like that. So you want to break down individually. 
And so we have HVAC. What do what we budget? What we charge? What we charge? Contractor, etc. These these individual items, and then you add it all up and uh, see how close you were. But that way you can perfect it. That's what you're trying to do. It is not a perfect science. Nothing in real estate is perfect science. We are just trying to do the best we can. And unfortunately, uh, in rehab, you will make mistakes. There's just, it's it's going to happen. It, we've made mistakes. Um, it's it's not something you can avoid. So I would actually accept and embrace the mistakes you make and just prepare yourself that you're gonna, the budget's going to be broken. You're going to do something in due diligence. Copy. Yeah. Um, you know, your microphone's going to start tweaking or whatever. Uh, mistakes are going to happen in crazy. You will probably also be stolen from. Um, and, and not just like an AC unit running off, but or, or maybe somebody breaking in, stealing your appliances, that's happened to us. Or, uh, we've, had, uh, we've had subcontractors wildly overcharge us before. We've had, you know, we've had employees who buy their lunches on our cart. We've had all sorts of things. It happens, but the cost is usually smaller, is usually rather small. Not always, but usually it's rather small. But the anger and the frustration and the feeling like embarrassment is usually much larger. It, they don't, it doesn't match. So just realize it's gonna happen in the long term. Some, some guy is stealing copper out of your house. You know, what, what is it to them? It's a couple hundred bucks. This is not the end of the world. You're gonna get back. So think long term. Learn from your mistakes. Uh, there's every mistake, and I might go up here as a sign of his office that I really like. It just says make more mistakes. Uh, mistakes, if you're not making mistakes, you're making a mistake. Um, because mistakes, it's a learning process. It's sort of the, the you're trying to or perfect it. You know, you're going back and forth, a little too high, and then you finally get it. And so it, uh, making mistakes is a sign that you're growing and you're getting better. And so uh, embrace it and learn from it. Only if you learn from it. Only if you make a conscious effort to learn from it. And finally, the more systems, the better. I mean, we're not we we're going to make mistakes, but we don't want to try to make mistakes. And the more systems you have, the more you can, you can systematize the, the lessons you've learned. So we made this mistake, we're going to systematize a way not to make that mistake again. Like, I waited too long to start this project. Now I've got a scheduling system in place. Or this contract over building, I didn't see it. Well, now I've got a system to check the bill, and I just paid it. I, I didn't check the book. Now I've got a system to make sure that it doesn't happen. And finally, prepare as much as you prepare a lot, educate yourself, go to seminars, read books, podcasts, all the rest of it. But don't be afraid to jump in because mistakes are inevitable. But in the long run, it's the it's the people who actually jump in and make uh, to make to make the money. And that is uh, that is that. So I will open the floor up to questions on uh, we have I want you to elaborate on those mistakes because obviously if you're not doing the proper training or education or reading and, and you go in and you make huge errors or mistakes that those could have been prevented. It could have been. I it's it's a fine line, it's a balancing act. You absolutely should prepare. You should never you should, no one should if this is your first time you've been to a investment seminar or, or a presentation and you haven't done much research in real estate or than that, I wouldn't go out and buy your house another house right after. You definitely want to read some books, like Millionaire Real Estate Investor, The Flip, and uh, Jeffrey Taylor's book, um, and the 25-page ebook we sent out. Of course, you should read that. That's mm -hmm. mandatory. Um, <laughs> and, you, and you should go to the seminar presentations, podcasts, all the time. But at some point, you have to jump in, and you want to you want to jump in with every tool you can. But you don't want to you don't want to think. You, there's no point where you get there. There's no getting there. I mean, sometimes you'll hear like these really successful people talk about like. Um, you know, oh, all these mistakes I made in the past, you know, what, how ridiculous they were, but luckily now I don't make any mistakes, I'm perfect now. You gotta get that, that vibe from them. They never stop making mistakes. I mean, the, you know, Time Warner bought AOL. I mean, those guys have been <laughs> So, you know, uh, uh, what is it, uh, Murdoch bought uh, MySpace, and I, I, yeah, so, and he'd been around for a long time. So there's all sorts of things like that. You just, Learn as much as you can, but you need to jump in. And the key is not to that, oh, I'm just going to make some mistakes, I'll learn from those mistakes. You want to do as much as you can to prevent the mistakes up front. It's just to recognize that they are going to happen no matter, no matter how much you prepare. You could read and study and prepare for 20 years, you'll still make mistakes. 
don't let that fear stop you from getting in or moving ahead. That's the key point I'm trying to make. Does that answer your question? Where would someone new, especially to the area, start finding uh, general contractors and contractors? I understand to ask somebody like you if they're good, but how do you start no, to find them? Ask the, no, not ask if we're good, ask if they're good, ask who they are. They're, this room is the best place to start. So just going around asking people. Actually, um, Kim, Mary has a, where are you, Kim? I'm hiding. Oh, you're hiding in the back. Mary has a list of recommended contractors and vendors, right? Or is it? We don't really have a list, but we have a form, so you can go ask if you use this vendor, or, or can you recommend a vendor? Yeah, so you go to the Mary form and doing that, or just talking around the room. There's some contractors that you know. You want to come up afterwards, I can give you some recommendations. But. It's, it's called Deb's cell phone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This this room is great. Um, you can also go. Uh, you know, I mean, you can anyone else you know in real estate, a good place to, to ask. Um, or you can, you can go to like Bigger Pockets forums or Mr. Landlord forums and, and go to their. I think you have to go to the marketplace and ask. Are there any contracts you recommend? Or you can just call. I mean, you can even go past this. You can call on Craigslist or Angie's list of ads. Just make sure if you're going to do that. More due diligence up front, more asking questions, interviewing them, calling for references, things like that. What are the services besides furnace, you know, HVAC, do you have sent out regularly to your rental properties? Like, do you have pest control go out regularly? Or anything on like some that? of them, yes. Generally, Phil, are you going to talk about pest control here? Uh, like not too much. Uh, we basically, you know, uh, if we know that there's bugs, as long as they get it treated, um, and then for the first month that they're there, if they see anything, we'll make sure it gets treated. But we don't do it regularly for single-family houses because if bugs are coming in to a single-family house, that means the resident is dirty and it's after, their fault. We, we pay for it after how long? Usually it's a month. We'll pay for it a month, and then if it's after that, we, we charge it. We it's their resident. fault at that point. Because so, that point. Yeah, now, yeah. If, if it continues for longer a month, we'll make sure we take care of it. we got to make sure we take care of that. Yeah, we just charge it back. So then the only thing you provide regularly is HVAC. Right, uh, well, we do the furnace filters. We also uh, check the fire. When I mean, we're doing that maintenance check, we do the furnace filters. We check the fire alarms and carbon monoxide detectors. We also we put one carbon monoxide detector in each house. Um, we'll we'll check to make sure there are any leaks. We'll check to make sure all the, we should make sure the windows are functional. Not usually. Yeah, 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 yeah. We check to make sure there are any leaks, we, and we check to make sure that generally the house is in good working order and they're not complete really slops and they have destroyed them. So those are the only things we consistently provide. The rest is maintenance. Um, or How often do you do that, that maintenance check? Uh, every six months. Every six uh, I've months. heard a lot of a good way to remind yourself with every daylight savings. Remember, you got to do your maintenance checks. Yeah. You don't do annual uh, mechanical maintenance on these HVAC units? Well, that's like the furnace filters and things of that nature. Yeah, but besides just your filters, I mean, checking the floor, doing the tune ups, checking the freon. There's more stuff that we want to do, but it's hard to get to. It's, it's, it's kind of on a. Uh, Get to us. Um, it's uh, yeah. I mean, mechanical can go bad, and, it, and little fixes, preventative maintenance is great. But we also got a, we have a lot of properties that we're trying to organize it. So that's kind of like that. We want to get to that point. Where we're doing more things like that, but we're not having this current point. Yet. How do you take care of lawn care? Lawn care we leave to the, to the resident unless it's for houses and duplexes. So they're responsible for it. And if the city sends us a letter, then we get on their case. And if they bill, the city bills us. We we do the work and then bill right back. On a fourplex or greater, we do the lawn care ourselves. Eugene to Kansas City. Did you throw a dart? What? 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 <laughs> <laughs> um, so, well, I guess it actually started like this. Um, first and foremost, um, my dad is from Wichita, Kansas, and my mom was raised in Emporia, Kansas, and we've got aunts and uncles. Our great, our grandparents are in. Are in uh, Wichita, we've got uncles and aunts in Wichita, Gardner, Emporia, Springfield, just all over the place. This is where we're from originally. So the Midwest makes sense. Uh, we were we were sick of flipping, and also right right when we kind of gotten sick of flipping a little bit, and like this isn't really getting us what we want, and uh, this thing called the first time home buyer's tax credit went away. Do you remember that? And literally, I looked the sales the month just dropped. Out. Pending, pending sales, the next one just dropped in half. And it just killed the sale, the ability to sell these properties. Plus, we were doing a lot of short sales, and banks at the exact same time tightened it. They used to be just giving them away. And then now it's like, no, we're not, we're not going to sell for anything less than the VPO. The, the so, 
So we got sick of uh, beef guns and appraisals. And then a friend of ours, who actually partner, uh, our dad's partner with in a separate business, was coming out to Kansas City. Uh, he was investing all over the country. And he was one of the, um, and he had, uh, he had come to Kansas City and he invited us out on a trip. We took a trip out here and we looked at the, the prices here versus the prices in Oregon and the rents here versus the rents in Oregon. And the prices were much lower and the rents were a little bit lower, but not that bad. And the rich costs were much better. And it just made it just hit us like this makes perfect sense. And then we actually went up to see the Woosters, uh, who were in St. Joseph at the time, and they'd just gotten their third big complex under contract. And they're just showing us this 150 unit complex that uh, that's like, oh wow, like they're buying this for this price. I mean, they, they bought a 150 unit complex in Riverside for three million dollars. They needed to put only like a couple hundred thousand. I mean, it's just ridiculous price. And it just kind of Kind of hit us like this makes perfect sense. Our family, our extended family is all out here. Um, you know, we've seen this market a bit. We met a, a real estate agent on that trip who was very, very high quality, and uh, and we'd seen also what the Woosters were doing, and they were having tremendous success. And it just kind of hit us. Let's, uh, I we did some double checking. We checked like, okay, population growth is increasing. Uh, the crime rate is, is, you know, the measure is is kind of high, but it's also going down a little bit. Um, the rest is, you know, the bank rates aren't too bad, things like that. So we did some double checking on the fact that that's kind of the drove that. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned briefly that you don't like to pay contact person like under the table or something, but like, don't you find like the cheapest, best deals are like, let's say country are super cheap and right, it's all over the table cash only, like would you not do that? We would not, no. I mean, it, it's up to the, the discretion of any individual investor what they want to do. But you can get, I mean, you, you get caught, I mean, if they if they get hurt, oh, yeah, the big problem. constant problem is they get hurt. I mean, you can get charged for not having insurance and workman's comp, but if somebody gets hurt on the site, you they're going to go. If the contract's got no liability, they go to you. So there's a big risk you're taking there. In addition to that, we have a, a fairly not we don't have a huge footprint, but we have a decent sized footprint. We're not we're not uh, we're not going to you know we're not going under the radar anymore. So. We don't want to do that for the liability issues and the uh, and the potential costs. And but if if you know, I would recommend against it. But it's up to any individual investor's discretion. We found um, an average ballpark is the same for appliances here as in Eugene or other other, other markets, or do they vary vastly? No, they're pretty close. They're pretty close. Uh, there might be a couple of little differences, but we haven't seen many. Biggest cost is between brands. For some brands, the appliances can be huge and expensive, and some are pretty cheap. But the ones we're buying now are like an entire set for like $12.50 or something. So it's a pretty, pretty good deal. Right? One more question. One more question. Who's got it? <laughs> well, you guys, you guys set up wholesale accounts. Uh, as much volume as you're doing, I think you could make wholesale deals of some kind and really save a lot of money. Yes, yes. We have uh, wholesale accounts with Home Depot, Lowe's. Uh, yeah, we have credit accounts as well. Right. Also, with our with our landscaper, we have a lot of landscaping, so we get a really good deal for all that stuff. And, and yeah, if you do things in bulk, you can get a cheaper price. And remember, uh, Mary has the two percent Home Depot uh, cost savings. So what was our last check? Do you remember what that was? Oh, it's twenty five hundred bucks. Yeah, so the last check we got from uh, the Mary discount was twenty five hundred dollars. So make sure to take advantage of that. Hmm.